Uh, today is a, a wonderful uh, time to be in church, and uh, we have a great friend with us today. And uh, Michael and his wife, Ebony, they moved to Dallas around the same time that Anna and I did in 2012. And Anna and I have had the privilege of just watching uh, their obedience to what God has put in front of them. And we get to be a great part of that today. And so I don't want to belabor this. Uh, I want you to know him as he joins us as just a man of God that just obeys what God puts in front of him. And so because of that, we're going to have a wonderful time today. Cape, I hope you're ready. Sarah, I hope you're ready. Would you put your hands together and welcome Michael Jr. as he joins us. Awesome. So we're going to have some fun. It's going to be great. We're going to laugh. Pastor Josh is awesome. I like really awesome. Took me out to eat. Uh, what was that place? Hooters. Oh, yeah. It was... <laughs> I was just playing. He went by himself. I didn't go. I know better. So I want to say something. So my job, before I get started, is really to kind of uh, read people. You'll find out, like, I'm really good at kind of reading scenarios and people. I just want to say that that guy right there is legit, and he loves people. So here's what I mean. I don't mean legit like I know him. Like, I don't know him. We just met. I mean, we've known, we've known each other. We've been in the same circles. I know how he get down. I could check his resume if I need to. But I'm talking about I, I, I see it in him, like fully. His wife is well. One of his kids, the other one's little. <laughs> I'm just playing. Um, like, I could see it, like, for real. I'm just, I'm, I'm just letting you know it's there. It's legit, like, for real. He's not perfect because you don't need a perfect leader. You already got one. So, um, boom. Dope. So with that being said, we're going to have some fun today. We're going to laugh and stuff. And if you don't laugh, it's okay. I already got my check. I'll be fine. <laughs> don't worry about me. I'm just, I'm just serious. <laughs> so God absolutely loves you. And here's, there's three verses of scripture that's going to apply to what I'm going to talk about today. If you want to, you can write them down and then read them later. And I think they're going to pop in a new way as a result of what we do today. So if you want to, no pressure to write them down, but uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, then John 10, 27, and then Revelations 3, 20. And as a bonus, you can go to 2 Romans 4. <laughs> There's no 2 Romans. If your Bible got a 2 Romans, you should take it back to the Dollar Tree. All right, so I'm basically going to share with you my church experience up to this point. Like, when I was a kid, first of all, we're laughing already a little bit. When I was a kid, laughing at church was illegal. You couldn't laugh at one time I laughed. I was seven years old. My grandmother took me to this church when I was seven years old. These people jumped around, and, and this lady, her wig fell off. I cracked up laughing. I cracked up laughing. Then my grandmother would pinch and twist. I can understand a pinch. You going to twist? That's the devil right there. <laughs> Church was miserable. You don't understand, it was miserable. My shoes were like three sizes too small. And my grandmother had this thing called a shoehorn. So if your foot don't fit, now it do. We walk into this church and this dude is up on stage and he is mad at everybody. And I'm seven years old trying to figure out why is he so upset and I figured it out. He was mad because he had some phlegm that was caught in his throat. Because at the end of every sentence, he would try to get it out. He'd be like, the Lord said, ah. <laughs> act like a, ah. it, was, it was a black church, in case you're trying to figure out. <laughs> it was miserable, and he had a Bible in his hand. He kept playing like he was going to throw it at people. The Lord, ah, ah. and everybody in the church would get scared. They'd be like, hey, man, hey, man. I realize now they were saying amen. I didn't know, bro. I didn't know. It was so scary. One time I went to church, there was a dead body in the front. Nobody explained to a seven-year-old Michael Jr., this is a funeral, it's not church. I'm thinking, yo, that's how they roll. Like every few weeks or so, they bring a dead body in as some sort of example or something. 
dude on stage would yell at us like we did it. I asked my grandma, I didn't understand. I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? It was miserable. My, my shoes were three sizes too small. My shirt, every Sunday, I wore a white and brown shirt. and was super tight. It was, in fact, it was actually just white, but the buttons were so tight that it was... <laughs> it was just not good at all. Yo, I want to say what's up to the Cape Carroll uh, campus. You guys, what up, capes? Capies? Capos? If you guys can see me, if you could raise your hand and wave at me, if you could see me at the other campus. It's great, awesome. People here are waving. Maybe you don't understand. <laughs> so at 14 years old, instead of forcing me to go to church, my grandmother did something different. <clears throat> she asked me if I wanted to go. She gave me an option. I was like, let me think this over, Grandma. No. <laughs> so I wouldn't go to church. I'm like, I'm not going to church. This stuff is whacking. I'm not going to church, man. Me and my friends would just hang out. We were broke when I was a kid. We were broke. We had no money. I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. <laughs> they found out about our situation. It's like, we have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so 14 years old, we were broke. We had no money, and we would play games. Remember the game Slug Bug? From the East Coast, they call it Punch Bug. Here's how the game works. If you see a Volkswagen Bug, you get to hit your friend. Those are all the instructions. In my neighborhood, they would take this game a little too far. They would add to the game. You ever play Uppercut Fire Truck? What about Minivan Body Slam? You ever play that game? It was always that one crazy dude in a group who would make up games on the spot, like hit you in the throat tall building. You play too much, that's my esophagus. We also made a deal, me and my friend, I still remember, we made this deal that we wouldn't curse anymore. We don't know nothing about Jesus. We just, we told ourselves we wanted to expand our vocabulary. Truth is, is we just wanted to be, be violent. This is what I mean. If he heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest hard as he wanted to, and I had to just stand there and take it, and then vice versa. Duke could hit hard. I stopped cursing immediately. <laughs> then I also noticed around this age that I was struggling with my reading. Like, I noticed this, and I was like, man, I'm struggling. I read fine now. As an adult, I read fine. Like the signs over the door to say excite. I could read that stuff, right? <laughs> but I used to struggle with my reading. I couldn't sound words out phonetically. My, it just didn't work that way for me. I'd have to look at the word differently. I would look at the font size and the color and the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people responded to it. I actually came up with seven different ways to look at a word to determine what that word was. Then I got really good at it. To the point in high school, people didn't know I wasn't really reading like everybody else. I was just working it out really, really fast. Now as an adult, I read just fine, but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place that I pull my comedy from. So that very thing from my past that looked like it was a handicap, it seemed as if I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he has me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing, even though I didn't know I was practicing. Let me say this again so you can hear what I'm saying. That thing from your past, the fact that you never met your dad before, one of your parents was an alcoholic, you were molested as a child. God didn't cause that, but he'll use it in preparation for what he asked you to do. You've been practicing. He didn't cause the practice, but he can use the practice. Maybe someone else needs to hear your story so they can be set free and you can too. You've been practicing. So as a result of my practice, I find funny everywhere. It just shows up. People ask weird questions, right? Michael Jillian, where are you from originally? I'm like, originally, huh? Well, I was conceived in Michigan. Yeah. Before that, I was with my dad. Um, and uh, then there's a swim competition, right? <laughs> and I won, which is crazy, right? Because currently I don't swim at all, man. But I used to swim. I used to be fast, man. I was fast. And if I don't find, like comedy, it literally shows up. Like this, this next, well, it's, well let me just say it. Because I'll, I'll find funny everywhere. So I'm at a, I met a family from Africa who came to America to adopt a white kid. Her name was Emily, um, and they changed it to Ubuntu. 
Yeah, yeah, and they don't know how to do her hair. It's crazy, so. <laughs> 26 years old, I moved to New York City. The reason I moved to New York is because I'm doing comedy now, and I want to know if I'm funny. And in New York, if you're not funny, the way they let you know is they'll say something like, you not funny. So in New York, there's a comedy club called the Comic Strip Live, and it's a really hard club to get into. In fact, comedians who are new in town, in order to do an open mic on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., they would start lining up at 6 o'clock in the morning so they could put their name in a hat in hopes that their name gets drawn and they can do 90 seconds to three minutes in front of the manager. It is very hard to get into this club. And right before I get on stage, right before it's finally my turn to perform and I'm about to get on stage, this comedian named George Wallace walks in. He's very established as a comedian. In fact, when he walks in the door, whoever's next normally gets bumped. They either they have to wait or they don't get to go up at all. I'm next, about to get bumped. The manager's already walking over towards me. But no, this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. The manager comes over and he says, listen, Michael, George Waz is here. Um, do you want to go on before him or after him? First of all, you never get an option, ever get an option. I was like, before him, please. So I go up on stage and I, I go on before, and I got New Yorkers laughing. Then he comes in the room and he's laughing as well. After the show, there's a bunch of comedians around me, all ask them questions. He leaves them and walks over to me and he says, you know, you're really funny. Let me ask you a question. He was like, why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know if my grandmother walk in or something, man. <laughs> my grandmother ain't coming to no New York comedy club. What else was I going to say? My friend might hit me in the chest. I'm a grown man. <laughs> so he says, you're funny and you're clean. I'd like for you to do a show with me and my best friend in a couple nights. I didn't know who his best friend was. I was excited. I'm pumped. I'm like, yes. I get to the show. It's me, George Wallace. His best friend is Jerry Seinfeld. Oh. I do two shows. I got two standing ovations. I rip. I'm the man, like for real. Like, I'm feeling great. By the way, let me pause. There's just, I can't go into the depths of it. There's, this part of the story is in, in a book I wrote. I'm homeless living in my car at this time. Seinfeld doesn't know it. Nobody else. I'm living in my vehicle, homeless at this time. But whatever. Got two stand ovations. I'm pumped, excited. After the show, the club manager walks up to me, and he says to me, Hey, Michael, you had a great set. Let me ask you a question. Um, would you like to go to church with me this weekend? I was like, Church, man, back up. You're making my feet hurt. I don't want to go to church. <laughs> Why would I go to church? Like, that was the weirdest thing ever. I was like, nah, I'm cool. I don't, I'm good, man. There's, listen, there's only two reasons you do anything in life. I don't have time to go into this as much, but I just want you to catch this. There are only two reasons you do anything in life. To avoid pain or to gain pleasure. Test this when you go home. Do the math on all the decisions you make. It's for one of these two reasons. So when he invited me to church, I was like, no, nah, I'm not going. Immediately, I was trying to avoid some pain because when I was a kid, church was miserable. So I was like, no. 20 minutes later, his fiance asked me the same question, but she was fine. <laughs> I'm talking about beautiful. She had some kind of accent too. She was like, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? <laughs> I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day, man. Find me a church. So I go to this church for the other reason. And I get to this church and I can't even find these people. I don't see them nowhere. The church is huge. I'm sitting way in the back somewhere. And this dude comes out on stage and he's talking about Jesus, just like Pastor Josh. He's just talking. He's just explaining God's word. He's not screaming. He's not yelling. He don't got no perm. He's just explaining. <laughs> and I'm listening to this dude. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty. And then he did this thing where he did an altar call. And he said, if you want Jesus in your life, all you have to do is believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Raise your hand, do this prayer, and Jesus is yours. And yo, Ocean, I really wanted to do it. Cape Crow, I really, really wanted to do it. But I was like, nah, I got to read the pamphlet first. Because I knew a couple Christians, and they was creepy. I didn't know the rules. I mean, there's some creepy Christians out there. If you don't know any creepy Christians, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. Your friends know one. Yeah. Or should I say your friend? You've only got one friend. She gave birth to you. So I was like, nah, I can't, I like, I need to find out. So I need to, I told myself I'd read the Bible first. 
I didn't even have a Bible. I didn't understand how big it was. This lady who I don't even know, a few days later, I'm at, the, I'm at a, somewhere near a mall, and this lady hands me a Bible and walks off. We never talk. I was like, all right, I'm going to read this thing. So I opened up the Bible. First thing I read was the copyrights. The Bible was made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was like, man, me too. That's crazy, man. I've never met before. So now I'm reading the Bible and I'm going to church. Now I really want to give my life over to Jesus. But I told myself I'd read the Bible first. Like, you, don't, you don't have to do this. I just wanted to stick to what I said. So I'm reading the Bible. I'm going to church. I'm reading the Bible. I'm going, I got to the part about the job. I'm like, no wonder I don't want one of these. That's crazy, man. So I'm reading the Bible, going to church. Then I got to the part about Ma the part of Matthew where it said, Jesus died for me. I did not know that Jesus died for me until I was 27 years old. I'd been to church before, people screaming, yelling, or no, I never understood it in a way where people, where they were just teaching in a way I could understand, like Josh is doing. Like, you, I just didn't get that before. So I read it right there in Matthew that he died. I was like, man, then I turned to Mark and he died again. <laughs> then he died in Luke. I got to John. I'm like, why are you going back in the garden? I don't understand. Listen, for real, I wish that was some comedy I wrote. I really thought Jesus died four times. I didn't understand. I didn't know it was just different accounts of the same thing. I was like, this dude, I don't, I'm following him, I guess. We're going in the garden together. And now I understand some stuff. I used to just think I was funny, but I know now that I'm funny for a reason. And it's not just the comedy aspect. God has caused me to think this way so I can do some things differently. It shows up in comedy but it's showing up in a bunch of different places as well. That's really the gift. And I got celebrities, some that you would know who ask me questions about God. They'll say something like, explain God to me. First of all, I can't just explain God. If I could explain him completely, he wouldn't be God, it would be me. And I'm not him, not even close. Remember that dude who said he was Jesus a while ago? He said it was, it was a long time ago. He had followers and everything. He had a compound, he said he was Jesus. I looked up a picture of him, the dude wore glasses. I can't be your follower. You got an optometrist. You're not. <laughs> One celebrity, whose name I won't say, said to me, how is it I can do all of this stuff I'm doing? And people still say that God wants a relationship with me. How's that possible? And this is all I could come up with at the time. I was like, uh, so, and this isn't even close to how awesome God is, but this is all I could come up with. I was like, so God is like a navigation device when you're in a car. You ever been in a car with a navigation device before? You ever been in a car before? We could start there. Y'all ever been in a car? Okay. It's like being in a car with a navigation device. If it says go 10 blocks and turn left, then you go three blocks and turn right. It doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. It recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. Only problem is if you keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions will be different. They may be rougher and you're running out of time. So you have to be sensitive to listen to that voice so you can make the right choice about where you're supposed to be. And that voice sounds an awful lot like a coach because you haven't been practicing for nothing. It's game time. So now I'm at the point where I got to choose a story. Probably can't do both stories. <laughs> got to choose. What's your name up front with the dimples? She's cute. She got dimples. I love dimples on women. I think that's so cute, man. Only in the front. Do you want to say that, though? Well, you know, anyway. <laughs> they sit in a church? Yeah. Anyway. What's your name? Yeah. Carol. 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 Cool. Carol. I don't think I'm going to have time for both of these stories. I'm going to let you choose one of the stories. About the first time I ever did the Tonight Show, the very first time, or the first time I went to prison. What you want, Carol? You want both. Why you got to be that way, Carol? All right, let me see if I can squeeze them both in. Carol, all right. I'm not, I'm not going to. The, the other one's in the book. I'm not going to be able to pull. Okay, no, no, I'll, I'll see if I can do it. Maybe if we could stop talking right now, I can start the story. <laughs> all right, so, this, so I have a nonprofit called Funny for the Forgotten, where we go to homeless shelters and prisons. But even before I had the nonprofit, um, I felt like God wanted me to go into prisons. So this is my first time ever walking into a prison, and I'm scared for real. I'm going there to do comedy. I'm scared. As soon as I walk in, the warden takes my belt. He's like, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. 
Can't they just boo me like regular people? You gotta hang somebody? I'm in prison, my pants loose? That's a bad idea, man. I got seven different ways to look at this, man. So I'm walking this prison, I'm scared, they got the bars open in front of you, take a few of them bars and they keep on, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, welcome home. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going in this prison and I'm scared and, and, and I'm expecting like a stage, there's no stage, there's no glass, we're not doing comedy on the phone. And I'm, at first, it's not as scary because I got like eight prison guards around me. So at first, it's cool. But the deeper we get into this prison, I don't know if these cats was getting hit by dart guns and falling out. But I had one dude left at the end. I'm pretty sure his name was Bernie Fife. <laughs> this dude says to me, hey, this is as far as I go. I was like, well, me too, man. I'm just going <laughs> to stand here and tell you a joke. But I know God was telling me to go in there. I know he was. So I go in this here, and there's all these prisoners in this big circle, and there's a little hole in the middle of the circle with a pathway, and I'm guessing that's where I'm supposed to go. Problem is, as I'm walking down this pathway, I don't have a joke popping up in my head. I got nothing. Seven different ways to nothing. I look cool on the outside, but if I get to the middle and land and got nothing, I don't know what's going to happen. They gave me a little black box with a pin in it. They said, if anyone tries to attack you, just pull the pin, and then we'll come in and help. That was the plan. So I'm walking, I got three steps left, nothing, nothing. I'm walking, two steps left, nothing. Three st I had one joke pop up, but I didn't feel like I should start with it. I was gonna be like, you know what? You guys are a captive audience. I just wanna say that. <laughs> didn't feel like I should start with that joke. So I'm walking in, I got one step left. I lift this foot up, nothing, nothing, nothing. I settle this foot, and for real, sitting right up front is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. When I said these words to Moses, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison ward, I want you to look him in his eye. You look him right in his eye, and I want you to say, let my people go. <laughs> For real. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? The truth is, it wasn't as much pressure as you might think because I've been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was struggling with his reading. I was practicing just like you've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here to let you know you've been practicing. And for a lot of you guys, it is game time. But you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. Another thing I want you to catch from the story, and I didn't say this for the first service, this is for some people in the room. As I walked into the prison, I didn't know what I was going to say or what I was going to do until I got my feet where they needed to be. You probably don't know how you're going to do this thing God is calling you to. But you don't need to know. In fact, not knowing is part of it. All right, I'm going to try to pull this off. This is going to be a fast story. All right, here we go. So I leave, I leave New York City because it's too expensive. Crazy expensive. Move to California. <laughs> My cousin got a couch that I could sleep on. He said I could, I could stay on his couch. So I get to California. Right, and it's a great story. The, rate, the way I got to California is a miracle. I got to California, I only had $17 from, Chicago, from, Chicago, from New York to get to California, I had $17, and I got there. Like, I, I got there with $17. God is amazing. I think it's chapter 14, it's amazing. Anyway, so I'm in the California, and um, there's a club there called the Comedy and Magic Club. It is the greatest club, and I can't, this club is so prestigious, I can't even physically get inside the club. But George Wallace is in town, and he calls me, and he says, do you want to go to the Condé Magic Club? I'm like, absolutely. So he takes me to the club. He can't get me on stage. He can only get me inside the club. Then at the end of the show, he takes me into the green room, and there's some soldiers in comedy. There's Jay Leno, George Wallace, Gary Shanley. These are some soldiers in comedy. And now that I'm in a room with them as well, and at the time, you guys may remember, a football player got hit in the eye with a flag, and he was suing the league for $400 million because he lost his vision in one eye. All of these dudes are helping Jay Leno for that, with that subject for the monologue on The Tonight Show. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just happy to be in here nibbling on french fries. <laughs> By the way, the reason I was only nibbling on french fries, they had a big spread of food. But I didn't feel like I had contributed anything to these people at all, so I was just nibbling on fries. But your gift will make room for you. So they're working on a joke, then they got quiet and they looked at me, and I was like, oh, snap. This is an opportunity. 
I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. He got hit in the eye with a flag. He lost his vision in one eye, and he's suing the league for $400 million. Um, he not going to see half of it. <laughs> then I grabbed a piece of chicken. <laughs> Here's the thing. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? It wasn't that much pressure because I've been practicing just like you've been practicing. Some of you guys have been practicing since you was three years old, maybe even before, you've been practicing. Some of you guys practiced through this hurricane, you've been practicing, but for a lot of you guys, it is now game time, but you have to be able to hear the coach's voice. So me and my wife were looking at some old home videos recently. It wasn't super old, it wasn't like a VHS or whatever. Um, some of the young people was like, what's of a hush? So we're looking at these videos and we came across this video of our youngest daughter being born. And I'm gonna share this video with you. It's not her being born, cause that's not a video I should share. <laughs> the video you're about to watch, I took the video, but I'd never understood the power of it until I watched the video like you're about to do. So let me set it up for you. Our daughter at the time is two and a half minutes old. She's two and a half minutes old. And they got her under the little chicken warmer, the little <laughs> the thing to keep the french fries warm. Right I don't know what kind of insurance we had, but that's, that's what they was keeping her warm under. <laughs> so, they, so they got her in a chicken warmer, and then she starts to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. <laughs> okay, Portland, look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay. It's okay. I'm right here. Right here. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay, baby. That was pretty doggone powerful. Now it's like seven, maybe seven and a half minutes or so later. The nurse is done cleaning her up and she starts to cry again. I speak up and she stops crying again. But I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. Portland, right. Portland, it's okay. It's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. So listen, there is going to be times, and there has been times, where you feel like you've just been practicing and practicing and practicing, even to the point of tears. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice because he is talking to you. And what he wants you to know is that he loves you. All you have to do is open your eyes. You hear some music? Oh, yeah, not yet, man. It's not yet. It's not your concert. We're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. You're like, you're getting us, <laughs> you're getting us all emotional, man. We're not. Just one second. I'm sitting here like, Lord, is that you? No, no. No, that is you right now. I got one more story I need to tell. One more story. And then, then at that point, you could slide in. But did y'all feel it? Was y'all getting emotional, too? I was feeling it, too. Yeah, yeah. You early. You early. That's okay. You early. You early. So... So I want to tell a story about having a relationship with Jesus. But first, I want to tell you how I came up with this story. And then after I tell you that, I'll start the story. And then that dude is supposed to slide in right there. <laughs> that was smooth, man. That was smooth, though. I don't know where you came from. Are you married? You married? You, are you married? You, are you sure, dude? You're not sure? You're like, uh, I was, I was going to propose till I messed up just now. I was going to propose, but now I shouldn't. So... Let me tell you what this, how I came up with this story. All I was doing is I was writing a joke. I was writing a joke. And I was writing a joke about the good room. How many people in here know what the good room is? Raise your hand. See, there's not a lot of hands going up in a room because, let me explain. Most of you do know what the good room is. The good room is that room in your grandmother's house or your house. It's that one room that's better than the rest of the house. Can't nobody go in there. It's plastic on the furniture. <laughs> it's really just for looks. How many people know what the good room is now? Raise your hand. Exactly. Cape Curl, how many of y'all exactly? So I'm writing this joke about the good room, and in the middle of writing this joke, God stops me and tells me to tell this story to his people. So I'm going to tell you this story. Now would be a great time to jump in if you want to, bro. Just, he was early and late. That is amazing. How do you do both? 
<laughs> He's awesome. So I want everyone in here. This is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. This story came to me as I'm writing comedy. But this is a story I feel like I should share with you. So I want you to imagine everyone in this room, everyone watching right now as well. I want you to imagine, imagine that you are a house. You're a house. And outside of the house is Jesus Christ. And he wants to come in. But he'll never force his way in. He just won't force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. And the reason some people in this room have not invited Jesus into the house is because you're cool with the way things are right now. So it would seem. Whenever you need something, you walk up to the door, crack it open, say a little prayer, tell him what happened. Then you close the door and go back into the house. But that's not a relationship at all. How can you hear his voice under those circumstances? How can you utilize the practice under those circumstances? And the reason you won't let them into the house, for some of you, is because your house is a mess. Or you think you need to clean it up just a little more first. How's that working out for you? There may be drugs or pornography in the house, alcohol, or you're just being busy doing a bunch of stuff trying to stay distracted from the mess. or relationships, you brought other people in the house, hoping that somehow maybe they could distract you or maybe they could help you clean it up. But they can't. The only one who can clean it up is standing outside the door wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand, waiting on you to open the door. Then there's other people in here right now who used to have Jesus in the whole house. But whether you realize it or not, you've moved him to just one room in the house, the good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the one right up front with the big window? So when people look in, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. It's just that one room. So when they hear about you coming to church, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. It's just that one room. You got a favorite Bible scripture, but it's just that one room. You pray sometime, but it's just that one room. You give money, but it's just that one room. Jesus wants access to the whole house. And I'm telling you, if you would just open this door and let him in, he'll show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit. And they will make sure the house is functioning the way it should be. But none of this happens if you don't invite him in because he will not, he will never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. So if everyone in here, if you could just close your eyes and bow your head. I ask you to do this so you can have a private moment where nobody's looking around. If you're in here right now and you know this is you and you need to invite Jesus, it is time for you to invite Jesus into your house, whether it be for the first time or to give him full access to the house again. I'm going to ask you to do something really simple. On the count of three, I just simply want you to put your hand in the air. You don't have to overthink this. Just if this is you, just on the count of three, just put your hand in the air. One, two, three. Nice and high. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Okay, go ahead and put your hand down. And first of all, let me say this. You can look up at me. First of all, let me say this. I am proud of you. Now listen, more times than not, I feel like God has given me a number on how many times I need to repeat that phrase for some people who have not received that phrase from a father's voice before. So I'm going to repeat that phrase that number of times. And this is not just for those who raise their hand. This is for the people who just need to hear that from a father's voice. I only want you to work to receive it right now. I am proud of you. 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 
So listen, there's something else that I want you to do, right? This is for everyone who raised their hand, even those who should have raised their hand. Jesus says, if you will take a stand for me before man, I will take a stand for you before my Father in heaven. So what that's going to look like right here is everyone who raised their hand, even those who should have raised their hand, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and remain standing so we can pray together. When we pray together, it's basically like this. When you raised your hand, it was like you were opening the doorknob. Notice how high the doorknob is in this scenario. It's because you're like a child coming to him. But when we stand up and pray together, it's as if you're blowing the door open so Jesus can come into the house. And again, this is for everyone who raised their hand and even those who should have raised their hand. On the count of three, I want you to stand up and remain standing. And to help with that, everyone around you, they're going to pray as loud as they can. I'm sorry, they're going to applaud as loud as they can. But it will not compare to the applause that the angels in heaven will be doing when you stand to your feet and remain standing. One, two, three. Just stand up and remain standing. If you're standing up, don't clap if you're standing. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. If you're standing up, you don't need to clap. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Good stuff, dude. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. So, here's what we're going to do. Keep standing. Keep standing. Keep standing. I know the I know that the default is after the applause of man stop. The default is to want to sit down. This has nothing to do with them. This is not horizontal. This is vertical. This is vertical. And there's six, there's about six people in here who are sitting down who should be standing. And you know who you are. You're feeling a little scared or not sure. This is your moment. There's six people in the room who are sitting who should be standing. There's four people in the room who are sitting. Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a prayer together. Then after that, they normally bring up a white dude to make it official. I don't know why they gotta do that part. I don't know what they <laughs> We're laughing in the middle of a life-changing moment. <sighs> Uh, God is different than you think. So we're going to pray. I want you to repeat this prayer in the privacy of your heart. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to this earth to die for me. I thank you that he rose again on the third day. Thank you for forgiving me for all of my sins. I believe it and I receive it. Come into my heart, come into my house, and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so listen, here's what's going to happen. He's already lurking. Here comes a white guy. I knew it. <laughs> so here's what's going to happen. This is for everyone who are, who's standing who made this choice, and even those who couldn't. Uh, at the end of this, normally what happens is we have this moment. Well, normally when you come to church, you get out your car, you come to church, you sit down, you get up, you go. For those who made this decision, I'm going to ask you to do something different. But I'm not going to tell you what it is. I just want you to do something to break the pattern of what you've always done so you can get something different than what you've always gotten. You're going to break the pattern in the physical and watch what God is going to do in your life in the, in the spiritual. Just watch what he's going to do. So I just, I don't know if that's just introduce yourself to somebody else. It might be just to sit in your chair a little longer. One thing I love to tell people to do is when we dismiss, there's going to be a prayer team up here ready to pray with you and anybody else who needs prayer for any reason. But there's going to be a prayer team right here. What I'd like to have you do is after we dismiss, for those who made that decision, I would like for you to come this way while everyone else is going that way. Why? That seems hard. Why would I do it that way? It's the same conversation you'll have with God as he starts to call you to do what he wants you to do. God is going to be calling you to do something that most people wouldn't do. They're going to be going that way. And he's calling you to go this way. And you would have already practiced it in his house. So when you leave his house, you can go get it done. I so, so, I love you guys. Like, I know it sounds weird. I'm not saying that like because I'm supposed to. 
there's something extra special cracking in this room right here. I didn't tell the last service I love them. It's not that I don't like them people. I'm just saying, <laughs> I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you in the lobby. Sign the stuff and stuff.